I'm kind of short. <laughs> okay. okay. I am really, really happy to be here. Um, I love going around the country and teaching people about cults. Uh, because they really do threaten our society today as they have for centuries. And I think coming here is particularly exciting because you all are a part of a group as either as community members, as alums, as students, faculty of the Clinton School. And that implies that you care about doing things to impact the community and make it better. So I'm hoping that today I'll talk a little bit and I'd love for us to interact a bit if you have some questions and I hope you leave here feeling motivated and feeling a call to action. Um, Whispering in the Daylight looks like this and the books are for sale right over here from Wordsworth Books. University of Tennessee Press published it and um, To start out, I want to tell you a little bit about the book. And to do that, I want you to imagine the year 2008. 2008. And imagine that you knew nothing of this world before 2008. Imagine that you're about 11 years old. And you are living on another planet. And you've not really seen any any world out here except um, by running through it a little bit in a frightened sort of way. What would you have missed if you were stepping into Little Rock today after, um, or in 2008, and for the first time seeing the outside world? What are some things that you would have missed before 2008 in our society? Cell phones, absolutely. What else? Hmm? The internet, school, movies. Um, if you if you weren't in this world before two thousand eight, and you were about eleven or twelve, then it would be likely that a friend would say, what was your favorite Disney movie? What's your favorite Disney movie? You wouldn't know what a Disney is. And that's what it was like for these children. Now imagine, not only did you not know this world before 2008, imagine that when you came out, every, you were told that everything you learned was a lie. Imagine how that would feel. And that was kind of what happened to these kids. On September 20th, 2008, the FBI raided Tony Alamo Christian Ministries at Falk, Arkansas. You all know where Falk is. And um, unfortunately, news of the leak, news of the raid had been leaked. And so as a result, Tony Alamo had been able to move lots of children and people across the state lines to Oklahoma, even on to California, to Texas, kind of squirreled them away. So when the FBI did get on that site, they found six young girls, ages 11 to 17, um, and that those were the only children they took that day. This book is about their journey, as well as other children's. Following that day, there were a number of raids and they gathered many, many more children as a result of of those raids. Here's what the lives, let's look a little bit at the lives of these children before the raid. First, a little background though. Tony Alamo and Susan Fleetwood at the time, and then Lipowitz, met in Hollywood, California. They established the Tony and Susan Alamo Foundation in 1970. With over 1,000 members by 2008, the compound in Saugus Canyon had expanded to many sites within the U.S. as well as some overseas places. The Alamos were operating a multi-million dollar business through the forced free labor of their followers, reselling donations that were made by national chains and throughout other shady dealings, they made a lot of money, and it was all tax exempt. 
because it was to the church. The lives of the followers were brutal. Behind a fence, guarded by security cameras and armed men 24-7, rules were rigidly upheld, even though they were also changed often, so the rules were inconsistent. Isolation, random and frequent reorganization of families, units, hunger and sleep deprivation were used as coercive tools to break down and indoctrinate the members. Public beatings of children were common, and caregivers and siblings often reported bad behavior to Alamo, which resulted in beatings and general widespread lack of trust. So Tony enforced the, the, his rules through the tattle system, and members believed that he could read their minds. And so if they didn't report something, he might, he would know it, and he would get me because I didn't report it. Some people would report a lot of people thinking that'll put me in his good graces. Um, nothing ever put you in Tony Alamo's good graces. But as a result, there was no trust with anyone, siblings, parents, wives, husbands, aunts, uncles. Insecurity and stability were the norm. Everyone was given a very strict schedule to work that benefited only Alamo's bottom line. Excuse me, I'm gonna have some water. And it was all to raise money for Tony. They tracked across the US. Some of you may have received flyers on your cards at some point in your lives from the Alamo group. They're still being tracked right now. They worked in the print shop. They worked in warehouses, designing jackets, um, house duties, cooking, maintenance on the compound, taking care of babies. These were all unpaid jobs performed by members. Boys and girls were strictly separated. And work, the working age started at eight. So um, the children didn't really have a childhood. They would say they did. Um, I asked one young man, well, what did you, he said, we had fun. We had fun when we were kids. And I said, well, what did you do that was fun? And he said, well, I sat on top of a building on the roof and played with nails. And I said, that really doesn't sound like fun to me. I'm afraid of heights. Weren't you afraid up there? And he said, my dad was a whole lot more scary. And that was when he was age eight. Um, Tony taught that once girls had their periods, they were ready to be married. And so he would appoint marriages. He would, you know, an older man would come and he would say, marry this child, young woman now, eight, nine, ten years old. Um, and he also freely took those girls for his wives and in fact had many girls living in his house after, after his wife Susan had died. And he, he took them as wives and he also uh, raped them, molested them, beat them. The followers truly believed that if they left Tony Alamo's church, they would be killed. Killed. The day of the raid, those six girls thought they were going to be killed. And the FBI came in with guns because they didn't know what they were going to find. Um, they were told all the time that they would lose their chance for salvation if they left. They were told they had no skills and we would become drug addicts or prostitutes at best if they left. And cult members believed these words. Such was their sense of self after being brainwashed by Tony Alamo. When recently I was in New York doing a podcast to go with a, a, a show that's going to be aired in, in February, and we were talking by remote to a, young, to a young woman who was one of Tony's brides at a very young age, and to another young woman who had been raped by Tony and molested by Tony. And as we were talking, um, we asked the question, looking back now, how do you feel about Tony Alamo? What do you see him as now? 
And the young woman who had been taken as his wife said, well, he had, you know, he had my whole life until I left, and I'm not going to let him have a minute of my life anymore, which is really healthy, really healthy. And she also said, it was a shock to me, but I realize now he never loved me. He never loved any of us. Well, the other young woman on the, on the remote line said, what? He never loved us? That's the only love I've ever known. When Tony looked at me, I felt the sunshine on me. You mean he never loved us? This many years later, this young woman doesn't have love, doesn't know how to love, doesn't know what love is because of Tony Alamo. The whole arrangement was utterly depraved and systematically dehumanizing. Here's what happened to the children after the raid. On the day of the raid, they were taken away to an armory facility here in Little Rock. There were cots, and the, the people there, DCS workers, had pizzas and, and wanted to keep the children comfortable. They needed to talk with them, and they wanted to pull them apart a little bit because they didn't want the children to reinforce the same story with each other. Well, the children all gathered, these girls gathered on one cot, huddled together, and one whose name is Victoria in the book, uh, Victoria kind of led them through singing hymns, reading Bible verses, and they didn't really need to read them because they knew the King James Version word by word. And so they would repeat Bible verses, and when they were offered pizza, they refused because they thought that might be the way they were going to be killed through a poisoned pizzas. Not, you know, as a, as a day went on, then they were taken and separated even from each other and taken to foster families. Now keep in mind, these children really don't know what a family unit is. So even to be dropped into a home with a mom and a dad and a dog and siblings, that's unfamiliar to them. And they are like aliens on Mars dropped in a world where they don't know the language. They speak English, but they don't know the language, and they don't trust anybody here. The foster families are the ones that truly saved them, and I'll say one foster family is the one that truly saved them, and uh, she is sitting to my left over here. Her name is Tanya Griffin, and Tanya uh, was received a call and took one of the foster children in and realized quickly she didn't really know how to deal with these particular children. Um, children in the foster system have a special set of needs and foster parents go through training to qualify for those, to, to meet those needs. But nobody has known what to do to help children who are born and raised in a cult. And so, uh, then um, if, you ask, if you ask Tanya today what, what, did, what made the difference, she said, I just loved them. I just loved them, consistently loved them. But she did so much more than that. Uh, she read the Bible again, with, with, mindful of their points of view, and always was ready to speak in their language when they said, this or this or this in terms of what Tony said the Bible said. And she would say, show me where it says in here that adults can beat children a hundred times with a two by four till they're bleeding. Show me where it says that. She would put post-it notes up on the mirrors every day with um, just good little words to let them know that they're loved. And um, Tanya, through the, also with The Call, which is an organization here, a church-based organization that merged with, that works with DCS, and that's really unheard of. They have put together a really strong model that helps hard-to-serve children in foster care. The goal of that group is to leave no child without a family in Arkansas, and they're closer to that than any other state I know of. So the foster system's important and needs to be worked on so that these children can go into foster care into a home that's prepared to deal with their particular needs. 
During the time soon after the raids, the children had to go to court hearings for custody. Now, their parents could take them back if they agreed not to um, let their children be raised in the cult anymore. They agreed to have a safe home away from the cult and so on. Some parents readily agreed to that and then really didn't follow through, but they got their children. Some may have followed through, and others said, no, I won't take them. Um, you know, I, I choose Tony Alamo. I choose the way of the Lord, according to Tony Alamo. And so it was another rejection that the children in this book had to deal with. The children from such a, a cult culture suffer all kinds of signs of alienation, detachment disorder, difficulty trusting forever. Um, they never really had a real childhood. And some services were, were really hard to get for them. They didn't have birth certificates. They hadn't had regular medical care, dental care. And to this day, um, you know, 10 years later, they still have dental needs. They still have medical needs. Um, two of the children I know still can't get passports. So it, it's just a constant battle to get on the same field as we're on. And it's very difficult for them. Children who are born and raised in a cult are different from anyone else in a cult because they have no pre-cult identity. If, if any of you, when you were 18 or 19, or even now, if you walked in and joined a, a cult, a coercive group, you would become indoctrinated in the way that happens. But then at some point, if you left, or if someone came and got you, um, it would take some help to get you to lose that indoctrination. But you would have a, a self in there that lived a bunch of years outside of a cult that anchors you. These kids are wired. Their values, their beliefs are wired by the cult leader, Tony Alamo. And then told that what he taught was false, just absolutely spun them downward. Um, what do you do with that? And the truth is not everything they learned was false, just his particular twists were false. So not everything was just because they were in a cult. Some things were normal, but they wouldn't have known the difference. They don't connect to any of us out here. I want to identify cult right now, and then let's talk about why do people join cults in the first place. When I talk about cult, I'm talking about a coercive, abusive group that's spiritually abusive, physically abusive, mentally abusive. Cult in itself is a, is a non-judgmental word. Um, a cult is really just a group of people who, are, who come together by a shared passion. So we have music cults, movie cults. Oh, if you all know of the deadhead, the Grateful Dead, there's a deadhead cult, lots of cults. But as I use the word here, it means something very terrible. So why do people join cults? People all the time say to me, it must, they must be people that just aren't smart. How can people join these cults? The truth is, cult leaders look for very smart people because they want people who will make money for them and recruit well for them. So it's the indoctrination process that starts to shut down our ability to think critically and divorces us from all those beliefs that we had previously to joining a cult. So let me give you an example. I need to know where we're doing on time pretty well. I'm going to give you two examples. Imagine when you were a freshman in college, or if you didn't go to college, when you were 18 and kind of stepping out to a new place in your life. That's a time of transition. You're excited, um, a little bit apprehensive, anticipating all kinds of new friends and experiences and things to learn, and you're excited about being independent. Um, a young woman named Sonia in California started college with those same feelings. 
And uh, this is a true story. Uh, she was the first of her family to go to college. She had uh, really good grades in high school. She'd been active in the band. She'd been involved in student council, had, was really well-rounded, and got a full scholarship to a very good college in California. Uh, so she got on campus, into her classes, and she was walking on campus one day, and a woman about my age, and a college-age woman, stopped her and said, excuse me, do you know who God the Mother is? And that caught him. It's like, that was sort of appealing. You know, I'm into being a woman, I'm into, you know, looking at the differences in our world, and I'm thinking about, you know, what is my spiritual journey? That's interesting to me. With a cult recruiter, all you need to do is stop, and they will start. And they stopped. And she stopped and said, no, I don't. And so they gave her a flyer that was very well put together and said, we're going to have an interest session on Wednesday. Um, it's right near campus. We can come get you, or if you want to come on your own, you can. And she said, I'll come. That sounds good. And because it was on campus where she was intercepted and uh, she was new and it looked interesting, she thought it was a club. She thought it was a university club. So she went and she met other students there. And the other students were really diverse. Um, they were from different places and she was really excited about getting to talk with them and they talked about spiritual kinds of things, and they referred to some things she was familiar with, with the Bible, and they also used other literature. And she, start, she went every week. She just loved it, um, as did the other students. She went home for, for the semester break at the winter holidays time, and she had straight A's. She had just knocked the socks off in terms of school. And her parents were really proud of her and excited for her. And she told them about this club. And she said, um, they are going to Haiti this summer. And I really want to go. It costs a lot of money. And we have to pay before we leave. But they'll let us pay kind of in installments over a period of time. And I really want to do it. What do you think? And her parents sat down and said, this is a stretch financially, but you're paying for school with your scholarship and we're gonna make it happen, we're gonna make it work. So throughout the next, through the spring semester, they sent in money and um, Sonia turned her money to the club, into the club to save her a spot to go to Haiti. Um, June came along and they went to Haiti and she was never heard of again. Uh, the group that contacted her was called the World's, World Social, World Missionary Society. And it's very prevalent on university campuses in particular. Um, they are hitting right, very hard right now at the University of Tennessee, Vanderbilt, Georgia, and Ole Miss. And they look for young women particularly who are in sororities because they think they have money. And they indoctrinate them. And chances are she's somewhere in the U.S. recruiting just as she was recruited because they not only require a bunch of money before you can be in it, but they also require you to recruit a certain number of people before you're kind of brought to the next level of prestige in this group. Um, it's been thought that it's a human trafficking organization. It isn't, but it is an abusive cult, very abusive cult. So let me tell you one other story before we, before we open it for, to questions. Um, and this too is a true story. Cassie was a recent college graduate here in Arkansas. And she worked in a restaurant while she continued to look for a job in finance, which was her field of study. She wanted to stay in state and kind of in the area. So it limited her opportunities. So she was, was not getting jobs as quickly as others were in her major. She was an only child, and she felt responsible for her parents, and she loved doing volunteer work. So she did volunteer in the community, and she was hoping that might open a door with her somewhere for a job as well. One day, a regular customer in the restaurant recommended that she contact a group called Armful of Help. 
a charity that she supported, the, the, the customer supported. She'd heard that they had an opening. So Cassie immediately called, and she was granted an interview. She came in the next day, and she was hired to work in an office, and it was a position that would eventually, she was told, lead to working with the finances in, a, in their organization. She felt so good because it was um, a charity that she, you know, she believed in giving to the community in that way, and it was also a, a job track that would get her um, doing what she was trained to do. She had no idea that Armful of Help was just a front for Tony Alamo's liquidation business. So she too became a victim to that. Any one of us, depending on where we are in our lives and what our needs are, can, can become victimized by a cult leader. And here's some things we know about cult leaders. There are lots. There are lists, and in the back of, of Whispering in the Daylight, there's um, a listing of traits. Um, the, the biggest ones I'll, I'll share with you, cult leaders are motivated by money and power. Money and power. That's what they want. Um, they're smart. They're narcissistic. They have no moral compass of right and wrong. Um, somewhat sociopathic. They speak the language of their targets. So if I were talking to you, if I were a cult leader, I would listen and I would pick up on some things about you. I might pick on that your family's important to you. It may, I may hear that you're really um, excited and aggressive about moving up in your work world. Um, I might hear that you lost a boyfriend or lost a wife or lost a child. I may hear that you really don't know what you want to do next and you're kind of floundering. And as, as a cult leader, I'm, I can figure that out, and I can tailor what I say to you that absolutely hooks you in. And I would do it very gently, and you would think I'm just, I have your best interest at heart, and that I will take care of you, and you can go anytime, and in fact, I'll give you a stepping off place. Then comes indoctrination, and the tools of indoctrination are really, really brutal. They're inconsistent and they're painful. Sleep deprivation, diet control, um, tearing people apart from anyone who's familiar to them. If you join, if you come into a cult for a church service and that's what you think you're there for and you're there with a friend, at the end of the service you will be taken away from your friend and taken into a prayer room and talked to and invited to stay and in fact the, it's a pretty hard sell. And you think, well, what would it hurt for a week or two? We'll see. And you're given free lodging. You're given free food. We take care of our, our people. Um, they absolutely shut down our ability to think critically. And I think that's the, most, the biggest piece, not being able to think critically. And you all can, but if that's shut down, we become followers and we become, bl become blind followers. Okay, what does this mean for our communities? Well, here's what we know. We know that cult leaders continue their control even when thrown into the penitentiary. Tony Alamo was, was sentenced to 175 years with no hope for parole in 2009. He died a year ago. He died in two, May 2017. And up to that point, totally controlled his, his followers. And from death, still is controlling his followers in the sense that there are four now who were kind of cronies who have stepped up and are running the show. And I will tell you, um, they have bought a building in Manhattan what does that tell you about their money sources? They're, they've got a lot. And they have opened a restaurant. They invite people in for dinner and take them to the second floor for a church service. And they're hitting New York really hard. The Saugus Canyon, their very first co uh, compound, is still in existence today outside of Hollywood, about 40, 45 minutes out of Hollywood. It's still going on. I can tell you Trader Joe's is still donating to them. 
thinking that they're helping charity. And I've talked with them. <laughs> and um, I love Trader Joe's. I'm not disparaging them, but somebody doesn't understand. Um, here's some things we can do. We can educate. We can't really, it's really hard to shut down cults. It's really hard to go in there because if we're over 18, we have the right to worship as we choose and to live as we choose in the name of religion. Keep in mind, this is not religion. This is a coercive group. This is not religion. Um, so we need to educate each other and our communities. There are over 5,000 cults in our country alone, and this number is growing. I can guarantee you there are cults in your communities right now. Cults can be small. There can be one-on-one -on -one cult cults. There can be a psychologist who controls his or her clients. Psychics can be cults. Um, there are so many, so many um, configurations of this. Um, Tony Alamo, while he, the, the compounds as we know them to be with, with the 24-7 security and the fences and the armed guards, while the only one like that is in, in existence right now is Saugus Canyon, um, he owns, they own all kinds of properties. They own duplexes, apartment buildings, homes, and so his followers live even next door to you. Um, we don't know how many there are, but we know that there's still people coming out and children coming out who need our help. We need to educate frontline people, law enforcement, DCS, people who are going to first <coughs> see these children so that the children are greeted in a way that will not reinforce all the beliefs they have been told about us. We've learned that children born and raised in cults have needs very similar to those who have, youth who have been radicalized. And so now we're working together, the International Cultic Studies Association is working with law enforcement and the world law enforcement to look at what can we do to reach these both groups, because they're very similar in terms of their, their needs. Therapeutic treatment approaches can be very much like how we approach domestic violence victims. The difference is it's a community of abuse rather than a home with abuse. It's a whole community. And there's an additional layer of, of a doctrine that drives that abuse even more. So there's some layers there that make it a little bit more difficult to work with clients who are coming out of cults. We need to be watchful of children. Someone asked me, what do I do if I suspect there's a cult in my neighborhood? And in fact, there is one right now that's growing. They're buying a lot of property in Brentwood, Tennessee. And a, a woman there said, what do I do? They're buying this property. And I said, be mindful, be watchful of the children. Watch for the children. And if you suspect anything, Ask questions. Um, call DCS. Call the police. Do the research on what, that, what they call themselves. And go armed with that information. A real problem is that when we go in to check on a child, um, the parent or the adult can say, no, you can't come in. And so then, they, then they have to go back and get a warrant and a reason to come in. And we don't always have that reason. But then, by the time they come back, the children, they're, they're not there anymore. So it's very, very difficult for us to get the children. And if you encounter people who are in a cult, if some of your neighbors are in a cult, it won't help at all to say, you're in a cult, you need to get out, this is not good. But instead, listen to what they have to say. Ask them what they believe. Ask them why they believe what they believe, and try to help them start to think critically again. And just see if you can get them with some of your questions and even talking about some other aspects of the social environment. Maybe they can start kind of piecing that together again. My biggest mission is to tell you all that there is no child who is ever safe 
in a coercive group. When children are not allowed to grow through their developmental stages, through their mental development, their emotional level development, their psychological development, they will not be healthy adults. Children who grow up void of connections with other people, void of feeling like they belong out here, void of thinking critically, they're the very ones that will go into a theater and shoot everyone in the theater. And they don't know why. But they're angry. They don't connect to anyone. They've been taught all their lives that they're worthless. And they have nobody. And we really have to do something about this. And I don't mean to be so, like, everybody's really grim. But and it is a grim message. But I think it's also a positive message. Um, we are not, we cannot let this go. And it's not easy. People don't like me as a luncheon speaker at Rotary because it's not real uplifting, you know? But it's a call to do something to help the children in our future. And I will tell you, whenever the society is polarized, the time is even riper for cults to develop. And it doesn't matter where you are on the political spectrum. I think we can all agree that we're polarized. And um, that, makes, that makes people run to people who are like-minded or people attracted to particular groups. That makes us all easy prey. Now I want to open to questions. But I will say, the docu-series, Whispering in the Daylight, is a part of a docu-series that Sundance World of Wonder Productions and NBC Peacock Productions have put together, and it will air with podcasts that go along with it in February. And it's four episodes, and they're going to air it on a Saturday and a Sunday, two and two, so that it will be real condensed, and I hope you'll look for that. And there are bookmarks on the table, and I want all of you to take one, whether you, whether you um, buy a book or not. I hope you'll buy a book, but if you don't, the, the resources on the back of that bookmark um, are organizations where you can get more info about cults, but also you can give that to people if they need help finding a family member or dealing head on with a cult, or if someone's come out of a cult and they don't know what to do, and often pastors don't know what to do. If you go to church, tell your pastor about this. Sometimes that's where survivors go, and pastors don't quite get it sometimes. Um, but also you can go to whisperinginthedaylight.com on my website and get a, a real good listing as well. And I say this because many cults pose as helping agents, and they're not. So it's really important to vet them carefully, and that list is vetted. Questions? Comments? Thank you, Debbie. Uh, raise your hand, we'll get a microphone to you, and we'll start right here, and then we'll go there. I'm wondering whether the uh, Internal Revenue Service has a role to play. To what extent are the cults, uh, are they successfully considering themselves as charitable institutions? Yes, they are. And Tony really was put in jail um, fairly frequently for tax evasion and also wage and salary violations. Um, but he wormed out of those pretty easily. His stay in prison wasn't very long, and um, you know the problem is he would put things in other people's names, and he would say it's all the church, and we knew it was Tony, but it's very difficult when um, the papers are produced that say this belongs to the church. He had quick claim deeds, and so could very quickly move properties around. Um, you know, and I think when it comes down to it, um, it's, it's such a challenge to nab a group that says they're a church and to really follow the money that probably there are other issues that law enforcement gets tied up with first. I hate to say that, but probably. I may be leading you in a place where you don't want to go, but uh, this past spring I did an article in the Arkansas Times on our president as a cult leader. And I used as an example some books that I had read in the past, 
plus a Psychology Today article from about five years ago <laughs> that listed 50 traits of a cult leader, and I find our president uh, incorporating about 40 of those 50. <laughs> Do you care to uh, comment on that from your perspective? I will say that um, I will say that many people have likened President Trump's characteristics to those of cult leaders, and you know I think you know, I think there are many people who stop thinking critically who follow him, and I think if one follows him, I hope we do it with a critical mind. Um, but you are not alone in seeing that comparison. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> really good that. I'm just curious, going back to, I have a real fascination about you talking about them being on a college campus. I work with young adults in campus ministry, and that frightens me. Um, because I know that to secure space on a campus or whatever, you have to be registered as a student organization. So how does all that kind of slip under the radar? Good question. Um, they meet very close to campus, off campus, but you know how sometimes it sort of blends in the kind of housing communities that are on the edges of campus. And they do recruit on campus. And I was contacted by uh, several colleges. Uh, when this was going on last spring, and uh, you know, I said you need to teach your students about being conned. You need to teach them, you know, that there are groups hanging out there wanting to attract them, and the resistance. I think the problem that some colleges have is, but they're doing it in the it's religion. And I said, that's exactly what cult leaders want you to think. And I said, you know, you don't need to, um, you don't need to even say it's religious groups, really any group that tells you who your friends are, that asks for an, a, a large amount of money, that, like there you go, <laughs> there you go, you know, that controls um, oh, I'm not going there anymore. Here we go with the president, and now we go with the Greek life. It's funny. It's funny. But yes, there are cultic um, symptoms in all kinds of groups and clubs, and that's one reason it's kind of easy for them to slither in. And um, I know it, at the University of Tennessee, um, I'm talking with, with the president there about setting up just a, you know, a one day, one session of the freshman seminars to start teaching how not to be conned. And um, actually, I think it would be really good to do it there because as we get older, I know I'm being approached with all kinds of cons that can sound kind of scary. Um, and if I weren't savvy, I might fall for them. So it's important when you see this going on on campus and with your students there, talk to them about it. Talk to them about just the features if you're being asked to do all kinds of things and not, you can't talk to your parents about this or can't, you know, can't be friends with these people or we'd rather one of us go with you when you go somewhere off campus. There are just, there are so many red flags. Right over here. Hi, uh, Hi. I've got another uh, one where you, I don't know, if, uh, it, it's a difficult place to go, okay. but I, I know that a lot of these cults uh, begin with religion because religion is basically a form of mind control. And uh, I, I'd like you to, if you want, want, want to go there, um, ad address the mind control aspects of religion which are, are, are suffusing all of our culture now where now we're mm -hmm. seeing churches, especially mega churches, trying to tell people how to vote mm -hmm. and, and certainly how to think. Mm -hmm. um, and well, would you would you call these mega churches and these other, and several other sects uh, a form of cult behavior? I think there are forms of cult behavior. I think it's important for us as followers to be able to recognize um, the danger again, the danger signs. And I won't say that it's terrible to be a part of a mega church. What I would say is, be sure you're, it's your belief system. And rather than being mind control, 
mind belief. This is what I believe, and this is why I believe this. And most people I know who go to church don't believe, you know, they kind of pick and choose sometimes. Um, or they may say, you know, I don't quite un quite believe that fully, but I feel comfortable here because of the fellowship or because of this or that or the main points I agree with. I think the important thing is to continue to be critical, critical, critical. And if, if there's any control sense there, stop, step back, and look at it and see if it's control or see if it's willingness. Does that help? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm from Northern California, so that's like Coltville, uh -huh. uh -huh. um, especially in the 70s and 80s. I, I was mean, in San Francisco in 1970. Yeah. Okay, so you know, like <laughs> People's Temple, the Moonies, I mean, there. every time you turned around, there was a new one. Mm -hmm. But what I am curious about is a lot of the things that you're talking about remind me of the things that I read when they raided the fundamentalist Mormon compound mm -hmm. and took all the kids. So even though they're not recruiting from the outside and like Amish people are not recruiting from the outside, there's still this really insular community. Would you say those are cults? I would say those are cults. I, they may not be dangerous cults. And I think, you know, the FLDS, I, th I think, is a dangerous cult. Um, I don't think the Amish is a dangerous group, and it may be that I don't know enough about them, but I don't believe they're a dangerous group. They are a cult. They're more a cult than a coercive group, and there's, there's such a difference in that. Um, uh, I think wherever our children are isolated and treated in a way that they can't think and grow freely. Um, there's something wrong. And I think if you look at the structure of the society within FLDS, you can see it's a very oppressive society. Um, I could never be an Amish from what I know. I, don't, I think I'd have to be born there. But if I were born there, I might really be okay with it. I don't know. But I think FLDS is a little bit different. It's a little bit off. Have that time. help? Yeah, time for one more. Yes. You mentioned uh, college students or people just out of high school. Is there any other demographic group that's particularly vulnerable to recruitment? Yes. Um, veterans who come back from a war. Um, uh, widows, very vulnerable. Um, really, whenever we're in a transitional point in our lives and all of a sudden kind of the floor drops out from under us for a little bit, um, it's amazing how how others can just step right in to help us, and before we know it, we're emboldened to, you know, we're, we're linked to them. Uh, whenever there's anything major in your life that happens, it's a life shock to you that makes you vulnerable. If you lose your job, um, one way Tony did lots of recruitment is he met other men in jail, and the men were worried about their wives and children because they didn't make a lot of money, they didn't know how they were going to live. Tony would write down the address of Saugus Canyon and say, they can live there, it's a great place, it's a God-loving place, and get food, and they'll be safe. And then when those men got out of prison, they couldn't find their children ever again. So even, you know, when life gets hard, you're vulnerable. Debbie, thanks so much for Thank coming back. Thank you.